Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alice Santos. I'll be the moderator today for Trauma, Memoir, and Healing. We have some amazing panelists. I'm so honored that everyone can join us. We're really excited to have you here. Just a couple of notes um, before we move forward. Uh, so given the topic that we will be discussing, I do want to let folks know that there will be some discussion of trauma, some discussion of the impacts of said trauma. Uh, we want to emphasize that folks can take whatever measures they need to make sure they're prioritizing their own health because there are some very serious topics. This is unscripted, so we cannot give specific content warnings, but I did want to make everyone aware. Also, we will not have a Q&A section afterwards, um, so we will be able to vote to devote all of our time to our panelists today. So without further ado, I'd like to get started. Um, we're gonna start by introducing our folks. So Ariel Bordeaux, there we go, um, who uh, is the creator of Clutter, a scatterbrained sexual assault memoir. Ariel, can you tell us a little bit about your work and what brings us uh, together? Yeah, um, let me see, uh, let's see. Well, I've been doing comics for, mm, I don't know, 30 something years uh, since, um, since college or post-college. And uh, it's mo most of my career I've been doing um, autobiographical comics, uh, mostly, I guess, I'm always kind of working out relationship stuff. Uh, I started out with some like difficult boyfriends, um, difficult friends, difficult parents, um, just sort of like w using comics to sort of work through some of that stuff. And then similar topics in a few fictional stories, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then the comic, the, the newest uh, book I have out, Clutter, uh, I started about 10, 10 to 10, 11 years ago-ish. Um, and uh, I knew that I had some sort of memory sort of swirling around in my brain, and I thought I had like a, a book idea, but it kind of took a while to sort of really get to the topic of, um, uh, of this sexual assault incident that had happened to me. And I think it's something I always kind of wanted to work into comics, but um, danced around it for a lot of years. Uh, anyway, I don't want to keep talking for too long, so yeah, that's a, a few things. Thank you so much. Next, we have Catherine Woodard Maynard, and I'm sorry, Woodman Maynard, and uh, you actually have an upcoming book, so. Um, I do not. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's about to go out on submission. Okay. So it's, um, I'm working on a, a graphic memoir um, called Unvoiced, and it's in the graphic medicine space, and um, it is about how my voice was repressed by my family's extreme secret secretness around my father's severe mental illness. And then in recent years, um, my father was hospitalized when he was in the psych unit. And I examined my relationships with my family through fairy tales, myths, and mysteries as I try to understand the intergenerational trauma that's been happening. Um, so that's, that's my current project. And then I um, did an adaptation of The Great Gatsby that came out from Candlewick Press um, in 2021, which is kind of interesting. I hadn't thought about it when I was working on it in relation to trauma, but there's actually a lot of stuff about how Gatsby and Nick Carraway, the heroes, were both, um, they kind of are interpreted in some people by having PTSD, and Nick's voice in the book is having PTSD, so I thought that was interesting. And also there are these lines about repeating the past and about trauma, you know, trauma as kind of, you can't, you keep trying to repeat the past or you're stuck in the past, and that's kind of what Gatsby is like, but I hadn't thought about that in relation to trauma when I was working on it, and then after I was like, oh, wow. Um, and then I do, um, I have a free comic you guys can pick up, um, at D4 is my uh, table, but it's just a kid's comic um, called Takami, Talk to Kids About Mental Illness, which I do with a child psychiatrist, and we just do one-page comics um, that are available for free, and we're just describing different mental illnesses, and that's, the goal is to be used by teachers or educate, you know, or mental health professionals to help explain mental health things to kids. Awesome, thank you. Next is Kayla E, who is the creator of the Precious Rubbish series. And if you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Kayla E. Uh, so I am a cartoonist. I have um, a book coming out from Fanagraphics, uh, spring of 2024. My work, um, really, I, all the comics I make are under the title Precious Rubbish, uh, which is um, encompasses 
all of my autobiographical comics. Um, I am a visual artist in like other senses. I do performance work, um, I, I make clothes, uh, I paint. Uh, but specifically, my, my cartooning work is entirely autobiographical and centers my extraordinarily abusive childhood. Um, and so my work is uh, very, very dark and uh, definitely like I, I tell people to take caution when, when reading it, um, just about any type of abuse that could be inflicted upon a child, I survived um, and I am writing about in my work. Um, yeah, so it, it, it centers uh, little Kayla, is her name, uh, and there's not a direct narrative through the book. It's, uh, it's sort of an experimental format uh, where it's not like a beginning, middle, and end. It's uh, reflective of how fractured uh, like a, abuse memory can be. So it like jumps back and forth through time uh, and like little Kayla's body like changes shape and everything. Um, but yeah, so, and, and this is a, a spread in the book. Um, there are a lot of like spiritual themes uh, throughout the book as well, um, which was why I included this particular beautiful line from this poem, but. Thank you. And next we have Natalie Norris, who is the creator of Dear Mimi. Yeah, um, Dear Mimi is. That's, sorry, Dear Mimi. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's my first uh, graphic novel, which is a memoir, and it's also coming out from Fantagraphics next summer, 2023. Um, and it's written in the form of a letter to my friend Minnie, um, who was a friend who I lost touch with, and it's about our reconciliation, and um, it's also like a cross-cultural um, relationship. She's Austrian, and it's about um, experiences that I had when I visited her, um, the themes are around trauma and sexuality, and it also largely deals with uh, rape. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us here today. Uh, so to get things started, one thing that I've noticed that runs through everyone's work is, because it is a memoir, there are a lot of parallels between the creation of memoir and the process of journaling. Journaling is a very common therapeutic tool, and several of you have actually written directly about how these process or par processes are paralleled. And I was wondering um, if we could hear some more of your thoughts about that. I am a big journaling um, freak. I love I love uh, just the power of it, um, and um, I did not always do that. It wasn't something that um, uh, I don't know. Um, it, I, my practice has changed a lot over over the years. I just but. Um, it's, I think that journaling sort of eventually kind of led to comics in a certain way for me, but yeah. <laughs> what I think's interesting about like doing diary comics versus memoir is diary comics are about just a specific moment, generally during my day, whereas when I'm working on a graphic memoir, I'm placing some sort of you know event in the context of a much bigger story. So in that way, to me, it, it can have a similar effect of kind of getting this usually uncomfortable experience out of my body and onto the page, which I find to be a really kind of magical experience, if I'm honest. Like, it, it moves, it's still in me, but it doesn't feel quite as intense. It feels a little bit outside of myself. But I think the difference with the memoir is I'm placing it in a bigger context, which is interested in relation to trauma, because trauma, you're often sort of like something that happened 20 years ago still feels just as alive to you today as it did then. And so when you're putting it in a bigger context, I think it, it helps move it further into the past, I find. Yeah, I agree. I, I sort of see a similarity um, more between diary comics and journaling because it is very like off the cuff. I tend to do straight to ink. And for me, I like to sort of keep them private until some time has gone by and it, it's not feeling so raw and then I'll share them. Um, whereas like memoir, I feel like because it is, um, there's more hindsight, you know, and you're creating like this larger work. Um, yeah, I think I think it does. It's like a different way of approaching healing. Um, mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I hate journaling. Um, <laughs> my therapist was really frustrated with me because I would try 
uh, not very effectively to journal. Um, and she really thought it would be good for me. But I, uh, so I don't really know if I see my comics practice as like relating to that. Uh, mostly, I feel like the reason that I make my comics, I don't know if it's like this for y'all, but I find it uh, torturous, very painful um, in every way. I don't enjoy making comics. Um, that's why I sew. I love sewing. Um, but I make this work, I think, in an effort both to, um, well, first, I think, selfishly, to mirror myself. So I, I uh, like a lot of survivors, um, gaslight the shit out of myself. And so like I will, you know, tell myself that like shit that I literally have scars for on my head didn't happen to me and like not only didn't happen to me but like that wasn't me, you know? So when I make comics about this work, um, it's very painful to do it but it's like I'm giving a gift to my future self. So like I won't look at the work for a little bit. Um, usually when I have a re-traumatizing moment um, where like a PTSD flare up or whatever, I actually go back to my own work and I read it and I'm like holy shit, yes, that happened to me like I be, like I believed myself when I made it and it really works like as a therapeutic tool um, later on and also like the other like part of why I make my work is an effort to mirror other people because I think that like being a survivor uh, of, of all different sorts of trauma is extremely isolating and I think that we probably all tend to gaslight ourselves and the world gaslights us uh, so the reason that I'm like telling these like horrific stories and putting this work out into the world is so that other people who have also had those experience can like see it named and see it visualized and I can tell them like I believe you that this happened to you and they come back and tell me the same thing so it's just like beautiful reciprocal relationship that happens. Yeah just one thing to follow up on that it's so funny because I also like will come back and look at my work. And I found a lot of people think that like the making it is what is cathartic or therapeutic. And I think like sometimes, but oftentimes it is, you know, I'm either in sort of like a trance and like not focusing on the content, like just like, oh, I'm painting, like that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like I'm gonna make this object really pretty and not focus on what it is. But then I find that later I'll come and I'll just like sit with it. And it's both like to help counteract that gaslighting and also I think then it's it you're able to process because you've externalized the memory and so you can look at it and it's like this tangible thing that's not just floating around in your brain that you can kind of try and 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 push aside and do you all feel that when it's more traumatic it's like my my drawing capacity decreases yes yeah. okay yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah. like it's like suddenly the style is totally different it's like scratchy okay this is not just me yeah and i'm like embarrassed to right. like share it on instagram because people think i'm bad at drawing or something oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sweet. That's so sad. Yeah. <laughs> so that brings up actually a great point. Kayla, you talked about sort of holding up that, that mirror and how it feels to, um, to, to create a representation of yourself. When you are creating these memoir comics, how do you relate to the depiction of yourself and how has that changed over time for you? you if you'd like to, yeah. Do you jump in? Sure, sure. That's such a good question. Um, so I have a really fraught relationship with myself uh, and, and the way that I look. I mean, I just like have severe body dysmorphia. Um, and I think that it's like pretty clear when you like look at the way that I draw myself. Like I know intellectually that that's probably not what I look like, but like my soul tells me that that's what I look like. And I actually like draw myself like uh, m the body, my body in totally different forms. So sometimes, like, all of my work is very referential to mid-century children's comics. That's the style that I draw it in, um, oftentimes, like, direct references. Uh, and I I'll draw myself with, like, Veronica's body in, like, one comic. And then the next one, like, Little Lulu. And then the next one, I'm just, like, this, like, short, little, chunky, 10-year-old girl that I was. Um, and I think that that also... Uh, I think is, is a way for me to uh, visualize and externalize my own experiences with disordered eating, where my body has radically changed. Like every six years, I basically look like a different person, um, thanks to that. But yeah, so I think that that's, that's a way that I'm like working through uh, self-representation in my work. Yeah, I think for me, it's been um, a helpful way to sort of 
foster like empathy and care for my younger self because I find that truly no matter who I draw even if it's like a terrible person or you know I I can't help but in the act of drawing them there is this sense of humanizing them and feeling if not empathy um just some sense of connection um which can sometimes be hard and confusing but um in terms of drawing myself I think that there is it is a way to kind of give love to myself that I wasn't able to give at the time. Um, and so that has been an interesting and I think sort of healing experience. I felt like I struggled more with how to depict other people um, and knowing family members and friends <laughs> so well and about how to make them look. And um, I felt like that was actually maybe harder for me, but my, my book also doesn't deal with kind of sexual trauma or sexuality, really, so it felt like my appearance wasn't as important kind of as part of the, the that kind of narrative, but um, I definitely, like, knowing people's body image issues, I really struggled with, like, how to depict others, and I got some pushback that I didn't make certain people hot enough, you know? Oh, my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, how do you how how do you really handle that when someone says hello in this book of some of the worst things that have happened to you? You did not make me hot enough. I just went no contact with my entire family, so I'm off the hook. <laughs> I have some of that too. <laughs> Sorry. No. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know. How, I, I, I'm still like, I don't know, I have conflicting thoughts, so I, I feel like my thoughts aren't organized on this topic, so <laughs> go on. That's fair. <laughs> no, that's, that's totally that's fair. fair. So part of, uh, part of this process is depicting trauma and depicting um, some of the effects that it has had on folks, um, in particular from, from Dear Minnie, um, Having to recount some of, you know, some of the instances that you have had, and also the way that some of these things feel, and, um, yeah, I I would love to know more about what that process is like as you're choosing to put put images down on paper, choosing to represent things in particular ways, so. A lot of times, I just don't have any control over, like, you know kind of getting something to look the way I want it to. Like, especially early on, people would often ask me, like, you know, why do, why do you draw yourself so ugly? Or, you know, I is just sort of like a matter of trying to figure out how to draw. And I still sort of struggle, like, with, with that. Sometimes I'm just, I don't know, I'm just trying to draw the scene. I'm not really, <laughs> not really aware of or in control of how well I draw it or... <laughs> Yeah, and, and how the, the process changes things as well as one sort of progresses through the healing process. Do you find that your depictions change in the work that you create? I'm trying. Uh, mine, absolutely. Actually, uh, there is work in my book that since I first drew it and wrote it 10 years ago um, has, has gone through multiple different iterations. So I'm like a relatively unpublished cartoonist. I've been making comics for like over a decade uh, and just kind of like developing my practice kind of just underground personally as a cartoonist until, because the subject matter was so difficult that it just wasn't, I didn't, I was still, I still had my family in my life for one. Um, but uh, yeah, so where was I going with that? Start thinking about my family, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, what was I saying? The depiction How depictions have time. changes. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. So I, I, I've gone through and like as I've, so I'm sober. Uh, I'm a sober alcoholic. Um, and that was like a huge like kind of change in my life. Uh, my work changed drastically when I got sober. And then I've also been through like years and years of trauma therapy. And so I've gone back to that work and just completely rewritten it, which is fine because it's not never been published anywhere. But I've like done it again and again and again. So like some of the work in my book has like been rewritten multiple times and like the way that my work looks is it's kind of like I have this framework that's like super controlled I do all my comics digitally um it's a major like control impulse the way that I do it um and it's like very precise and sometimes I'll just strip all the writing out of it 
and put an entirely new story in it, depending on like what I'm trying to say or how I'm trying to articulate a particular memory. Um, and like the the work, the visual work, like services different moments of my life um, in different ways over time as I'm able to say more and remember more. Because um, as memories have come back, like the first version of my book uh, had a, a really quiet uh, depiction of my relationship with my biological father. And as I've done um, a lot of work in therapy around that, uh, the, it's, the book looks entirely different. And I've since gone no contact with my father. Um, so it's changed a lot. Yeah, I think for me, um, when I drafted my book, I did it really fast and sort of in, it was straight to ink and almost felt like I was a little bit in a trance and it was a way to like bypass all of the conscious parts of my brain that I think try and um, control your perceptions of trauma and everything. And so um, like with the page that shows dissociation, it's, um, yeah, that one, um, it, it really, like, it, it just sort of came out that way in my quick sketches where it's almost like you become a ghost of yourself and, and that um, ghost is sort of, like, hovering above everyone else um, and then drawing it um, in the painted form. Like, obviously, it's, like, a lot more measured and so it might seem like there was a lot of conscious decision making in terms of how to depict this but really it it is just sort of something that came out almost like a dream in a way yeah i have pages like that where i just did quick sketches sort of to represent a theme and it was just pure from me straight to ink and then there and then i use those pages often in the book that are are that you know like kind of are that and then there are other ones that i've reworked so many times so i think it's just the variation of those types like some are just straight from the soul, some are really reworked so many times. And this is actually like, I've gone through so many iterations. I tried to write it for kids at first. All the characters were animals <laughs> and bears. My family did not like being depicted as birds. And so, <laughs> so this is now uh, adults. And, and um, so like, you know, trying to tell this story in different ways that feel authentic. And then uh, I've been working with Rob Clough, who's one of the organizi organizers of SPX. And he helped me kind of, he was seeing my work and how much fairy tales were involved. And so he was like, you know, I really think this could be a good framework. And once we kind of came on that, I was like, this is so right for me. Like, this is how I view the world. And that was sort of the framework that I needed to kind of, to, for it to feel authentic. But also, I think, to give a, a point that people could enter the story from, because I think fairy tales are kind of accessible. And also, it's interesting, fairy tales are also, you know, ways to pass down wisdom, which I think, you know, they're different views about intergenerational trauma that it's also a way to pass down, you know, experiences to future generations what kind of worked thematically. Yeah, and I I was very struck by this panel in particular um, because it it resonated that sometimes um, you know my my changes of how I describe things as I move through the healing process sometimes are very large and sometimes are very small and some days there are just days where everything seems focused on like I cannot believe what this parking ticket was so that's something that's very interesting about this process too is you know it's very expansive sometimes and and also very focused in others so um, one thing that I did really want to talk about was. <clears throat> excuse me, the process of self-care and sort of protecting yourself when you are making these very intense memoir comics and, and going through these processes um, of healing. And this also really resonated with me that perhaps we need stories because they help satisfy the dual nature of our brains. Um, and I thought that that was, I thought that was a, great, um, a great depiction. Thank you. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I I thought so. I thought so deeply about stories. Now I don't really even think of myself as like a storyteller exactly. I don't like the because I'm just kind of talking about my life a lot of times, and I don't. I've never been like great at the idea of like crafting a story, um, plotting it out, and writing something that makes sense. It always feels very um, just sort of intuitive and like. Um, and I've come to em embrace that about my writing style, and I'm. Um, but I, w I was thinking like so deeply about stories during the process of, and like what are they, and <laughs> really getting into that. 
Um, but yeah, I, did, I just think like we need stories, but then stories also can, can torture us. And <laughs> like the stories that we're telling ourselves about what happened, our own lives, or you know, whatever it is, or that stupid thing I just said, uh, those, those, those stories can, um, can really hurt us. So, so but, but I kind of want, I guess I was just sort of kicking against that idea of like, you know, stories, stories are wonderful, and be, that's so out there in the culture. I think self-care, I mean, writing a graphic memoir is so scary. I think that like therapy in comparison feels so easy to me, and maybe that's because I've been in it for like 20 years. But you have like a, you know, a professional who's like guiding you, who has all this experience, whereas when you're facing your page of your memories, you know, it's just you. And even if you have writing groups or whatever, it's still just you. And I think it's a really scary thing and not to be approached kind of lightly. Like I think it's, um, there's some, you know, reenactment, you're kind of reliving these things. It's a very intense experience. Um, and I also think sharing your work with people who are close to you can really be re-traumatizing. And I kind of worked that into my story where I, th I thought my story was very careful of the people in my life and they really blew up and I ended up not having a relationship with family members for a while and I still don't with one over the bird version <laughs> of the memoir. <laughs> and um, and But now I have a much better relationship with my parents and we did family therapy and it's actually kind of, I've worked that into the story now, but it was it was a traumatic experience that almost in some ways more traumatic than the actual things I was writing about. So I just want to say that because I don't know if I was naive. I knew that they would have a reaction, but I had no idea it would be so extreme. But of course, it's about the secrecy of my family. So yes. it's not really surprising that they would have a hard time with me sharing it. But just want to say that. Yeah, and I think what's funny is I find that working on really intense um, work like this has sort of forced me to face other um, unhealthy coping mechanisms in my life because I am really like committed to doing this work and the reality is that you can't do that and have you know an eating disorder and so um, at least for me and so it it has been there's been multiple moments of reckoning and having to um, you know seek out different types of help and I think sort of the best um, care is just allowing yourself to have the time and take pauses and I found that I would sort of work on this in bursts and I've been serializing on Patreon and so sometimes I would do you know a big chapter in one month and then you know take me eight or take me like three months to do an eight page chapter you know so it just it really varied and um, I think also I try and trust that the time it needs is the time that my brain sort of needs to process. Um, and so, for example, with drawing um, the sexual assault scene, um, I had it all penciled and then there was um, maybe a month or so that I just couldn't move to inks and had to seek out more therapy and did some experimental therapy <laughs> and um, yeah and so it's sort of been a catalyst I think for pushing me farther along on my mental health journey. Yeah um, so the panel of mine or the comic of mine that was up uh, earlier if you don't, can you go back? Yeah absolutely. Cool. Okay um, so one of the biggest uh, things that I had to work through, it ended up being a breakthrough both in my life and in my work, was that I was never loved. Um, it's a pretty big pill to swallow, and I've had a couple therapists inform me of that before I was ready to hear it, and just full-blown nervous breakdowns. Um, and when I finally like was able to internalize that, accept it, uh, and believe that like just the most horrifying truth that I feel like a person could have, um, I was able to make work about it. So this is um, this is a, a comic that has gone through Jesus Christ, like maybe seven to ten different iterations, both actually with the palette, the the way I've drawn it, and especially the text um, is just. <laughs> it was a mini comic. I did a mini comic of this one like a decade ago, and it's just unrecognizable from how it is now. Um, but so when I I also make work in bursts, um, and like I feel like there's a lot of 
maybe, I don't know, I feel like there's pressure as a cartoonist or as a creative person, especially on the internet, to be constantly productive. Uh, and I like really try hard to push against that because of the nature of the, the work that I do is so personal and painful that I just allow myself to take very long stretches where I'm making absolutely no art. Like I'm just sitting at my sewing machine and I'm making like a lot of dresses. And like I'll just make dress after, like, like a, I'm an addict, so like I'll just make dresses constantly. Like I'll make 15 dresses in a month, I've done it. Um, but I'm not like working on my book, you know, like I have a deadline and it just is what it is, you know, it takes what it takes. And uh, I think that my, I'm, I feel really like good about the work that I've made because of how careful I've been with myself. I also will not make comics if I'm doing, if I'm like doing well. Like if I'm like, feel like I'm, you know, uh, what's the word, like, uh, you know, I don't know, like I don't really live in my body. So like uh, when I am in my body, there's, you know, when you're like connected to your, integrated. <laughs> when I'm integrated, I do not make my work because it will like quickly disintegrate me. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like having like a CPTSD sort of like a uh, period of my life, then I kind of just, ugh, I don't know if it's good for me or not, but like I'll just, the door's open, so I'll just open it all the way and I walk inside and I just explore. And like that's where I make all my work. Um, and then I shut the door when I'm done and I walk away. Uh, and I try to just like, you know, ha be like a normal person again. But yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't approach this stuff um, off the cuff. I don't draw this stuff for fun. Um, I feel like that could actually be really dangerous for me personally. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, like, and, and brave, and, um, like, I, I wonder about it sometimes, like, well, you know, it took me so long to, like, actually, like, you know, get around to uh, maybe more, you know, more intense, more heavy stuff in my work, and um, I, I wonder about people who might be just coming into comics to work on something to process. Um, like how hard that would be, because comics maybe not necessarily the, um, yeah, it's not easy to like <laughs> work through that, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just think it's really it's it's incredibly brave. I would also say, at least for me, it also feels a little bit like a compulsion. Like I need to get this story out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I it, like an exorcism maybe, you know, to get this yes. get this out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have used that word a it's lot. So yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! I've both witnessed an exorcism and had like like scary uh, Christian Protestant men like lay hands on me and try to like excise demons from me. So like, I, I'm familiar with exorcism and it is basically the exact same thing. <laughs> We're all right. <laughs> a lot more hours yeah. <laughs> to do. Right. Yeah. Yes. yeah, Natalie, uh, in some of your writing, you said, who needs therapy when you have tarot? And that oh, yeah. really, really, I had to sit with that for a second. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's awfully close to home. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very much um, a, sort of a star in the constellation of healing, creating that kind of work. Um, one thing, too, that I have found fascinating about memoir comics is that depiction of sort of what you've called the second act, that sort of next step, what that looks like on, you know, down the path as you've done work. Um, Kayla, I want to pull up um, a depiction that I found very, very touching. Um, and now this is a diversion from a lot of the other work that you've done, but it was it was so sweet and such a wonderful expression um, of of hope. And yeah, could you tell us a little bit about sure. that? Sure. This is from my wedding invitation with my wife, the cutie and the red beanie there. Um, so my wife is uh, she's she's the Charlie the nun, and then like I draw myself as Petra the witch. So it was this big newspaper comic um, that I sent out with our wedding invitations. Uh, and it's the only like non-disturbing thing I've ever made in my life, <laughs> besides my clothes. Um, and so it's like kind of in that vein. This was actually so much fun to draw. It was just like a delight uh, because I have like an amazing wife, and I met her on a bus, and it was super magical. Uh, and like the life that we've built together is uh, like better than anything I ever could have imagined for myself as a child. Like I really, even that like I'm here right now, like I should be dead. 
Like I should absolutely be dead um, from for a lot of reasons. And it's a miracle that like I'm alive, that I'm sober, that I'm in recovery, that I'm married, that I'm out. I mean, my God, that I own a home in like a small town in North Carolina. So that's what our little house looks like with the pink mm -hmm. door. Um, we're going to repaint it so it's not going to be pink forever. But yeah, it's like this, this beautiful life where I, uh, I have like safe people, only safe people in my life. Um, I've, I've walked away from my entire bio family and that was extremely traumatizing. <laughs> like, wow, if you don't have to, like, definitely don't do it. Um, it's really hard. But yeah, so uh, this, this particular comic is, I don't really consider it as like a part of my body, like my like body of work as an artist, because um, you know, it was my wedding invitation, but uh, it does, if, f you know, for the few people who have it, like it gives them just a teensy insight into like what my life looks like now. Because if you read my work, you're probably like, whoo, that poor girl, like, but she's barely hanging on, um, which was true for <laughs> how I was for most of my life. Um, but I'm coming up on six years of sobriety. And so basically, I've had like a good, stable life for six years. And everything before that was a dumpster fire. But yeah, that's what um, this sweet little blast panel um, and, and my wedding invitation is from. That's very sweet. Thank you for allowing us to share that, by the way. Yeah. I, I find it just just so wonderful. Um, and some of the other sort of depictions of... I'm sorry? Oh, no, it's just very zoomed in. Oh. <laughs> um, I, depictions of strength and depictions of, um, you know, being, being able to move sort of through the future in a new way after some processes have occurred. And, um, yeah, I... I love seeing how those things are depicted and again, how they change throughout time. So can you tell us a little? Yeah, yeah. so this is uh, the bottom third <laughs> of, a, of a larger piece, but it's, um, I'm talking about uh, the DNA is kind of blasting <laughs> into a war scene and then that's, that's me and um, I'm actually talking about my mother and that the kind of that I had focused so much on what I felt like she hadn't given me, and then I realized what she had given me, which was actually karate, was one of the things that she got me into karate. I think she saw that I had these strong emotions that needed an outlet, and it was very physical, and it was like a really wonderful thing, but also journaling. Um, there's a journal there, and like kind of giving me a voice, even though you know it was through a journal, was a really powerful, a powerful thing, and it's cool to talk about about that in relation, in relation to this. So that's what that's what this scene is from. Thank you. And then, well, I'm skipping around. Um, Natalie, the, the sort of, um, I don't know, I, I found this panel almost sort of dreamy. And uh, you, I mean, you can almost feel the wind. And um, in the context of a book that had, or, you know, a body of work that had, that had so much going on, um, you talk about, um, just finding that innocence and being able to, to experience those feelings, so. Yeah, I think this was sort of like a moment of pause because um, my time in Austria was sort of like just a kaleidoscope of drinking and sex and craziness. And so there was this brief moment where I felt like I was sort of in a dream world and then of course, um, this page comes before the sexual assault, and so there's a way in which it's sort of alluding to something that is to come, but we don't really know what that is, but we know that eventually I'll survive and be looking back. And I think also for me, I've had a knack of having really traumatic experiences happen in really beautiful places, and that dichotomy and the sort of surrealness of um, the aesthetics being really lovely, and then there's this horror, and I think that's also why um, I started with this story, because I think that um, contrast is the most extreme, and I think it's also a way where I'm able to sort of like almost lull myself into um, a place where I can go to those dark places because um, there's something about like the aesthetics of beauty that almost can be, um, they sort of numb you in a way, or like they're, they're comforting. And so like leaning on that in order to go into these dark places. 
Yeah, and we both use watercolor, right? Yeah. And I think we've talked about how like we need to do something really beautiful <laughs> and fun in order to handle these hard <laughs> these hard things. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that too. Like, mm -hmm. I think, um, like, I, I, I really fell in love with like using the uh, acrylic wash paints, and mm -hmm. the, the, they come in these incredible candy colors, like mm -hmm. these just bright, bright, bright colors. And that was just, that was a really comforting aspect of, of working on the mm -hmm. comics. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's so interesting. I'm, uh, yeah, like my work is all digital and so I don't like allow myself any like actual joy in creation. It just mm -hmm. like flares up my carpal tunnel, you know? <laughs> There's like no like gestural kind of beauty in it. But it's so it's like when you were speaking, Natalie, it was like so interesting to me because um well all of my trauma happened in like trailer parks, dirty houses, you know, just like ugh, aesthetics were not good. <laughs> um and aesthetics are super important to me. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because like I'm I'm a graphic designer by trade, that's what I do. And like my work, I find it like visually like on point like the way that I construct my work like is so aesthetically pleasing to me and it like to me that is the only inviting aspect of it is like I love how controlled it is I love the color palette I use like I'm really into the way I construct my pages because I'm a designer and like I'm like this works you know so I think that that's kind of like my aesthetic entry point that if I made my work look like what happened to me I don't know if I could do it like, it's, it would be so ugly. Um, and I just, I don't wanna, I don't wanna draw ugly shit. So, yeah, that's just so fascinating. I, I bet a therapist would have a field day with that. It's really, that's cool. Yeah. And one more that I wanted to show up here because it, I feel like it summed things up very, very well. Um, I, you know, I figured out my magic cocktail there be antidepressants in comics, and it says it sounds like you're coping very well these days. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I always feel like so good when my therapist tells me like you're you're doing well. <laughs> but um, yeah, and and this was of course not a real session, but of course a contrived to end the end the book, and and um, mm. but it but it is very real and. Um, I, I, it took me, I mean, I, I kind of beat myself up for a decade because I, uh, I started this project um, when I was at um, Center for Cartoon Studies. That was my, it was my, the bulk of the book was my thesis work. And, um, but I was still very like sort of like, oh, I knew it was unfinished. I couldn't quite, couldn't quite get there. What do I need to do? I can't quite pull this book together. Um, so it took me, uh, just letting it sit and forgetting about it. And sometimes I felt a little heartbroken about forgetting about it. And I kept thinking, well, maybe I'll self-publish it. And, um, you know, just uh, having uh, Rob Klo is just like fantastic editor and publisher. I'm like so happy to, you, know, you mentioned him too. He's, he's wonderful to work with. And he kind of was just like, I just kind of, I think, I, I'm not even sure I'm quoting him right, but I think he kind of said like, I kind of want to know that you're okay at the end of this book. And, mm -hmm. and because I, he was like, I know you are. And, you know, and I, you know, so I, uh, I just did some more thinking about it, and I was like, oh yeah, I get it now. Like, so it was like the process of making the book really kind of helped me sort out mm -hmm. like, yeah, what is my magic cocktail of coping? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and I think kind of what we're, I, I think we all have so many coping mechanisms is what I think I'm hearing, you know, and, and I think that comics are, are one of them and, and a very important one to us, but I think, you know, I certainly couldn't bu get by just on comics alone. I still need the antidepressants and therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and actually that reminds me too that um, like it took me uh, reading some other things. It took me like uh, hearing from a lot of younger artists um, and people had to kind of uh, be, t like one one artist, uh, Anna Selheim, who's here exhibiting is a, is a um, someone I talk with comics a lot about, and uh, she was like, I think people should talk about, um, you know, if you're, if you're on, you know, medications, if you're on antidepressants, if they're helping, like, that's okay to talk about. Whereas I thought I had to kind of really keep that 
quiet for a long time. Like, you know, so I think it is important to say, yeah, that's that's part of it's part of the toolkit. It's part of I what love helps. Prozac. <laughs> I love, I'm like right. a Prozac, I, they should hire me. <laughs> I'm constantly talking about the benefits of Prozac and the combination of Prozac and Wellbutrin, if anyone has any questions, changed my life. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, um, it's really interesting that Rob, uh, like Ariel, that Rob like kind of gave you that feedback for your book, because um, Eric Reynolds is editing my book and I've been working really closely with this other cartoonist named Mark Newgarden. Um, and so he's been mm -hmm. like, he's been a mentor of mine for like well over a decade. And he and I are working together on, um, there's like a back matter section to my book. So it's like, there are gonna be two different covers and like the other side is like a, like a gag memoir. Um, and there's a lot of like written things in there. Anyway, so he's been really helping push me um, like conceptually with the book and taking it in different directions. And he told me <laughs> this like, I thought he was joking, but he said he was not. He told me after he read my book that it's the scariest book he's ever read. And I was like, wow, Mark, like, I'm not sure what to do with that. Because he's a really, like, I don't know if you're, you guys are familiar with his work, but he's very dark. Um, and he's like, there's, he's just not a, a particularly like, you know, like, that's a big deal. Um, and so I, like, I was like, OK, like, that's, that's a big thing to say. And he was encouraging me to, like, like Rob was, was telling Ariel, to like, find a way to let the reader know that little Kayla's OK. Because it is just a constant onslaught. Like it's a dense book. It's going to be like 250 pages, and it's dense. Uh, and I think that it's. Um, I haven't necessarily been thinking too much about. Like I think like for the non-traumatized person, this book is going to be very traumatizing. I think for the traumatized person, like we'll know how to handle it. Um, but I think for the non-traumatized person, there he's trying to help me find a way to uh, soften some moments of the book, to provide moments of pause. And I'm not, like, this, the, the book doesn't make sense having like a happy, you know, wedding invitation style ending to it. Um, but I, I am thinking about it a lot. I'm, I'm actually doing a, an, an, a new introduction to the book that's, uh, like I'm just redrawing a, a childhood story that I wrote like in third grade that is like actually like, I read it closely and I was like, whoa, like this is fucked up. Um, I was really like going through some stuff as a little girl and like going through it uh, visually and, 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 and drawn in written format. So I'm including that as the introduction of the book as like, I don't know, a landing, a landing pad for readers. Um, but that's something that I've been thinking about a lot and it's, I haven't quite figured out the answer to it yet. Um, but hopefully somehow people will get the message that uh, little Kayla ended up okay, because I do think that that's important. I get that. Yeah, it's funny. I had the same experience where I was so worried about how my book was going to impact, like specifically other survivors of um, sexual abuse. And I found that they were actually fine for the <laughs> most part of yes. like my friends who I talked to about it. and. It was people who hadn't experienced that, and specifically men, yes. who it just like wrecked. That's <laughs> what I wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> and it was kind it of, it, yeah, heart. it threw me for a loop, but in a way I was like, oh, okay, this makes sense. It's like people who have had these experiences in a way because they coped with their own life, they're sort of able to cope, and instead they're just feeling that, um, feeling of being seen and validated and not alone, like all of those things are what come through, the relating. Um, and then in terms of endings, um, my the entire story is like 400 pages long, so I cut it in half. And so the ending, I had to come up with a new ending for like book one. And I was really struck with like, okay, like it ends at sort of one of the worst points in my life coming home after this really traumatic experience and deciding to um, sort of making a vow of silence almost. And I had that in the back of my head the whole time drawing like, oh no, I'm nearing the ending. I don't know how I'm gonna end this. And I think it's like a difficult thing where you don't wanna like wrap a bow around these experiences and you wanna stay true to how it was. Um, and so I sort of solved it by just, um, I think because especially like children and teenagers, um, adolescents, it's like they sort of naturally compartmentalize. And so even though um, I was really traumatized, it's like I could kind of bounce to a just like non-traumatized state in a way. And so um, I think I solved the ending by um, just 
bringing back to like having a moment of like connecting with many um, online and, and just how it's like you can um, both be aware that you had this horrible experience and you know her being tangentially related and yet you're still like want to connect with her and you feel comfort in in that connection even though it becomes complicated but yeah the ending is is hard because you want to stay true but you also don't want the reader to feel like they just went through this whole thing and then you like drop them on the floor exactly. um but then i also think um just the act of having made the book does signify to the reader like and i think that's like i as an adolescent like i watched a lot of really horrible <laughs> like rape and revenge exploitation flicks <laughs> And I think that has definitely played a little into my work and the structure of the book. And I think that the way I think about it is that it's like um, my revenge is getting to the point where I can make this work and tell this story. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, we are starting to get toward the end of our time. So I just want to tell you thank you for everything that you've shared with us today. And I'd love if everyone could tell us where we can find some more of your work to check out. Ariel, do you want to start? Sure. Um, uh, let's see, more of my work. I am at uh, the Field Mouse Press table at M8, uh, table mate. Um, <laughs> and uh, I do have, uh, uh, in addition to clutter, there are some of my older work. There are some, um, a couple of, couple of issues of Deep Girl. Um, there's some, just some other minis. And uh, I guess arielbcomics.com. <laughs> there, I don't have a whole lot of like new stuff up on that. I'm, um, I'm at D4. And on Instagram, I'm at Woodman Maynard, which is my last name, all one word, um, which is also like my handle and my website. Um, and yeah, I have an adaptation of The Great Gatsby, which is Candlewood Press. I'm at table K5, and um, you can find me online. I have Instagram, Natalie, three underscores, Norris. And then I have a Patreon, which is just patreon.com slash dear mini um it's 18 plus so you can't search for it which is a fun fact um <laughs> so you have to go directly um and you can find the link on my instagram i'm table in 11 um and you can find my work at kayla ework.com and i have a private instagram um but you're welcome to add me and i will say yes it's at precious dot rubbish Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. So. And thank you, Alice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Alice. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody. I will see you all at the awards, I think.